Excellent. Well, it, it's good. Uh, uh, this, is, this is the point of today, is that we can come together because uh, the internet is fantastic in many ways, but it's not the same as actually looking in each other's eyes uh, and actually meeting. And then we can bring that online later. So it's all about the, the social networking. We're, we're coming together. All of us are using Moodle in some way. Uh, some of us are making Moodle. And we want this thing to be something that's so, uh, very useful and very important and, and, and something that helps us all. And so we have to work together to make this happen. And so that's why these things are so um, important and so good. At the end of tomorrow, we have the party. And you may think, oh, it's just a conference dinner. This is not just a conference dinner. This is a big social networking event. I've been telling everybody, make the party really big. So I hope you can all stay for tomorrow night because it's, it's going to be uh, an epic Bollywood affair. So, <clears throat> uh, look, I'm, I've got a, some time to talk and I want to tell you about what, what Moodle's doing. Um, at the beginning of this year, we reformulated the mission. It hasn't changed, but we, we made it more clear. And my intention was that we get the mission into something that fits on a t-shirt uh, and something that, uh, that everybody who uses Moodle can actually wear. So it's not about branding, it's about something we believe in uh, and something that is what the project stands for. And uh, this is it, right? Our mission is to empower educators to improve our world. The vision is, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build the most effective platform for learning that we can. Now I want to explain why. Why is this the mission? <clears throat> we all live on this thing. It's not very big. And this year, I've gone around it, I think, three times. Uh, and I'm going around it all the time. And I'm traveling a lot. And some of you, I, I think, also may travel a lot. And when you do, you really see how small it is and uh, that the seven and a half billion people on that planet, <clears throat> we're all sharing the same tiny ball of mud floating in space. And as a species, the human species, uh, we've, we've done okay for the last, um, uh, in, the, in just the last 200 years, these are some statistics of poverty overall. So you can see there are only 10% only of the world is now in extreme poverty. Uh, only 4% of the world of children are dying before five years old. Now this is still a lot of people, right? But we've made some improvements. Um, only 14% of the entire population has n no education. It used to be worse. Uh, as in democracies, about 50% of the world has a democracy where people have some say in the governing of their country. Now, the way, the way democracies are run is another story, but just having a democracy is a good start. Now, the UN, the United Nations uh, have 17 goals for sustainable development and these were developed after a very long process of consultation and these are the things that they're saying that the whole world needs to focus on, not necessarily to, to make the world a super amazing place, just actually simply to survive on this planet. Mm -hmm. Because we're starting to have, and we're getting so many of us that we're starting to affect the planet we're living on. So these 17 goals are quite useful and in my opinion, almost every major presentation or keynote should probably refer to this list because it's like a, a, a guiding star for how we should be working, all of us. So some of the bigger problems you see in there are inequality. And I was around Mumbai on the weekend and I could point to examples here but I could just as easily point to examples in the United States, which has extreme wealth and extreme poverty. And many, many countries have this problem and it's actually growing. 
the, the distance between the, the wealthy and the poor is increasing. And the amount of wealth in the hands of wealthy people is increasing related to the economy. So if you are very wealthy, you get more wealthy very fast. And uh, the, more and more of the whole economy is in the hands of fewer and fewer people. This is a trend. This is what's happening in, in many, most countries in the world. <clears throat> um, this causes a lot of issues, as I'm sure you can guess. Uh, we have climate change. 99% of scientists agree that the climate change is real, that it's happening, the climate is changing, we have something to do with it, and that it's something we can probably help fix. Uh, I kept asking people, is the, is the very romantic haze in the air here, is it, uh, is it humidity <laughs> or pollution? Everyone said mostly pollution. I, I, I'm, it's probably a mix of things. but. Um, the whole planet, we are, doing, we are not really uh, looking after our own planet very well. Food and water security. Just the quality of food, the quality of water. I would love to be able to drink the water from the taps here. I would love to. I think you probably would too. Um, the, in many countries, this is a problem. The, in, in a lot of the problems in the Middle East are caused by uh, crops failing for many years. There's no food. People are moving, it's causing disruptions, it's creating refugees and things like that, which leads me to refugees. 65 million people in the world do not have a country. They're wandering around. This number is growing. Data protection. <clears throat> more and more of our lives is now, we're, we're using these things. These are very addictive, they're very useful, uh, but we are starting to operate our lives through Technology, this technology is owned by other people. The technology guides our information from one place to another. Who protects data? Who protects people? These are very open questions and a lot of people are fighting for control over the internet and over the flow of data and the ownership of data. In many industries, we are automating. We are creating uh, robots, maybe physical robots like this, or maybe software robots that are doing the work that people used to do. Uh, I think when the British Empire was here, something they were famous for was creating machines, effectively, of many thousands and millions of people doing clerical work. And they, build, they, they built organizations of, of, uh, uh, to do work, but it's human work. And machines are replacing from the bottom. They replaced a lot of agriculture. Now they're replacing a lot of office jobs and things are being replaced. So what happens to people who are, who's, who are losing work? Are we planning for, for them to have a place in the economy of the future? What, what are we all, go, all going to do if the machines are doing everything apart from fixing the machines? Healthcare quality. This picture is in Africa, but it could, again, just as easily be in most countries of the world. There are often problems of healthcare uh, being e evenly distributed. Everybody cannot just walk into a hospital and, and get a, a heart fixed or, or a major operation um, yet. And that, that is something we should be having. This is a long list, right? I'm talking about the problems of the world here. We've got environmental damage. The, in, the, in the oceans that are around us are huge islands of plastic getting bigger and bigger every year. These are hundreds of kilometres wide. And it's all our rubbish, plastic, which lasts for hundreds of years, piling up, piling up, piling up. It's killing fish, it's killing the environment, it's killing us. So um, these are major problems we're causing. These kind of big problems aren't really going to be fixed by a single person or a single government or a single anything. It, kind of, it would take all of us to be, in my opinion, the, this kind of person. We need to be globally oriented. 
So not just thinking about our own backyard, but thinking about the context. Uh, multiculturally aware, which you, you can't care about refugees unless you have some, in, some understanding that a refugee is just a person the same as you in a different situation. Uh, environmentalist, we've got to care about the environment. Uh, it's very easy to forget we live in an environment when you're living in a screen most of the time. And caring, we've got to be caring people. And I, I think in India, I think, it, from my perspective, I, I think the, the, the level of, of care that I see, the, the, the love, basically, in, the, in, in this room, but in the streets, I think people, it's a very strong. I think as a culture, there's a lot of it. Um, just in the number of religions and the types of religions that are here, that there, are, uh, there is a strong caringness. Um, but I think we need that, and we need to extend that beyond just the family or be, beyond people around us to think bigger. So that's the kind of person I think we need. We need a lot of those sort of people to solve the big problems. So the only way I can think we get there is through quality education. It's not just teaching people to read and write. It's about teaching people to actually care and teaching people to have these uh, deep skills to attack big problems and to be active, right? Does anybody, uh, who agrees with that idea so far? Does anyone agree? We've got some agree? All right, good. We're all together. So it's number four goal of the UN is quality education. Great. So we're aligned with the UN uh, and quality is the key here. It's not just pushing some quizzes, people through quizzes to get them to a, a degree. It's about quality. Can governments give us quality education? What do you think? Yes? No? Look, governments are not bad. Governments are people like us. And a lot of them, are, there's a lot of good people in government trying to make things happen. But the, the nature of governments tends to be uh, short-term focus. They tend to focus on the next election. And when you have elections, you have people trying to win elections, and they're trying to make people happy and, and give them short-term wins. Um, it, you rarely see people thinking about what is this country going to look like in 30 years, in 100 years, in 1,000 years. It's not, let's worry about, the, the next government can worry about that. So you, you do see, tend to see, and I'm seeing it in a lot of countries, and I, I, I want to know more about India, so I hope we have some conversations about this sort of stuff at the breaks. I'm looking forward to it. But you tend to see the amount of money going towards public education overall going down. Because there are these economic drivers, like it's, um, you, you, you tend to uh, save money on those easy, it's easy to save money on public education uh, and use it for more popular things. You, it's also easy to encourage private schools and private methods to do education and you say okay they're, they're taking care of it um, and so you you see more administration more reporting uh, education becomes like a machine of creating people for skills for jobs you're making people for jobs you're not making those universities are not focused on making that they're focused on making workers to work in jobs which may not exist in five years. Uh, and it's just a trend, and I don't blame anybody, but it's just how these things seem to be working. Can capitalism give us quality education? Can we, can we rely on private companies to do all the work? Well, most companies are designed around profit. And profit is excess money, so you get money for something, which is fine. Uh, but the most companies are focused on how can we make the most money by spending the least money so that we have the most money left over and we can become very wealthy. And this wealth goes into becoming for venture capitalists and uh, investors and, and it goes into private pockets, right? So that's just how, how that is structured, unfortunately. 
It's supposed to work in capitalism that if there is a demand, that there will be a company will come up and supply the demand. But the, the big problems I talked about, there's not many companies who are focused on that. that there's no real demand there. The environment is not starting a company to save itself. Right? People have to start companies. And in some of the places that are very capitalistic, you have uh, a lot of wealth being collected in private people's hands and a lot of resources being used. And so again, I'm going to point to the US. 30% of the world's resources are required to go there to look after 5% of the world's population. And when I, I come to other countries and I see the same model trying to be replicated, so lots of uh, fast foods, lots of packaging, lots of, uh, we must have everything, the shops must be full of every possible thing that we, that we can imagine, and not just one of the, those things, there needs to be a hundred types of everything from all over the world, and we need fresh fruit from South America coming to India, we need everything, everything's got to be everywhere. Um, but we don't really need all of that, and uh, uh, shipping stuff around costs fuel, costs oil, costs the environment, and we're, we're, we're spending a lot of time uh, caught up in this kind of dream that we're creating, and we're actually damaging our stuff around us. We're not living lightly. So there is little incentive for a company to look after people as a whole. The, the point of a company is to make profit. So unfortunately, when it comes to quality education, there's not the right drivers to change the world in a company, through companies, in my opinion. Um, you can see this and there's a big, it's starting to become a backlash against the Facebooks, the WhatsApps, the, not so much WhatsApp, but the, the social media systems that are distributing news, the YouTubes, the, the, um, these sorts of systems, that because they're based on advertising and profit and selling advertisements, Everything is designed about capturing your attention, making you look at things for another five seconds, for another five seconds, for another five seconds, and they sell your mind, your attention, to an advertiser. And if you ever go to Twitter and sign up as an advertiser, and look, at the, look how Twitter looks, or Facebook, from the point of view of an advertiser, it's all about Oh, you can target your market down to, you know, 39-year-old women who live within two kilometers of the Mumbai Central, and, and you can be very, very precise, right? Because it's very, it's, it's very, um, the whole system is designed for those people. It's capturing people and selling them. So, you, when you, he you hear a lot of these technology companies talking, especially, they're always talking about, we're going to disrupt... We're going to replace, we're going to control things, right? Uh, I don't think that's a good language. I don't think we want to be disrupting our life all the time. Uh, it keeps everybody off balance. This is not an optimal situation that we've built. So, this is the only thing that I can find that makes some sense here. That open technologies, open uh, methods are a way of bypassing these two big systems, governments and capitalism. They're a way of building things that are bigger than those. It's bigger than any one person, it's bigger than a government, it's bigger than a company. It may be building something for the next thousand years. And there are a lot of people around the world working on open government, open standards, uh, open, in, open uh, education resources open music, all sorts of open things. And Moodle is open source, so it's, we fit in this tree. Who here is involved in some sort of open project in some way? We've got some hands? Who? Some open, yeah, okay, quite a lot of us, but a lot of us also not. You, if you're here, you're involved in Moodle, so you are involved in an open project. This is a good thing. It doesn't mean, I, I don't mean you have to be doing everything for free. I don't mean that you have to be like a zealot, like a, you know, a guru on a mountain trying to you know, create freedom. It, it's not that. It's 
uh, anything you have to do with the economy of an open product is, is fine because it's, it's a complicated systems here. But open stuff makes sense to me. It's like the only, the biggest thing we can work on right now. And look at some of the systems that are open, that are super successful, that are so successful that we forgot about them completely. Right? Email. We use email more and more. There are many other options. Uh, you've got messaging systems, left, right and centre. But we're all still using email. And the reason is email is completely open. Anybody can make an email account and you can mail anyone else. And all you need to know is a little address. And if, it, if you get the address wrong, it bounces back to you. And this whole system is an open system that actually works really well. I think we're still going to have email in a thousand years. Seriously. We'll be, you'll be sending emails to your relatives on Mars and it's, you know, it, it will maybe evolve, maybe you'll have different attachments, you'll send VR or something, but it'll still be email probably. HTTP is the, every address is HTTP because it's the web protocol, completely open. I could take this and install some software on it and make it into a web server and you on your device today can go there and see my information. We can pass information around from any device to any device through HTTP. And Unix. Again, all of these devices have some Unix influence. Uh, Android machines are basically a Unix variant. Uh, this is an iPhone which uses iOS which is based on Mac OS X which is based on Unix. Uh, all of the servers, all of the big dot coms, the Facebooks, the Apples, the Googles, they're all running on Unix. Mm. All of the routers that push the information around, often Unix as well. Nobody talks about that, right? It's just, it's everywhere, it just works. And that's, what op that's how open stuff works, right? Open stuff uh, drives everybody forward. So. In my opinion, these, these projects show how you can support and nurture and improve everything else. Uh, email didn't really uh, replace anything, but it supports everything, right? Um, and so that's what we want to do also with Moodle. So very briefly, this is like my dream. This is my dream of what an empowered educator looks like. An empowered educator is one in a world where quality education is seen as a basic human right. Why shouldn't everybody have a university degree? Why not? There's no reason why not. We, simply, we could do it. Uh, why, why couldn't it be that the very closest school to you is the best possible school that you, that you could send your child to? Why not? Uh, why couldn't teachers be uh, like uh, gurus or doctors or uh, politicians or celebrities? I mean, God, you, you see so many celebrities on posters everywhere. And they're just actors, right? So they're good at acting. They're good at pretending to be someone else. But they're not. Um, there are so many teachers who have a deep, deep effect. So many, um, and, and I, I think in this country, actually, there's a tr bigger tradition of this with uh, so many leaders uh, who are well known, but people who have a very good picture of the world, who are able to communicate, who are able to teach and bring people along, uh, why aren't they more in the public, in the, in the media? Why aren't they more mentioned on the news? Why aren't they more talked about? So these teachers w would get there if they were supported properly, if they were given Firstly, they've got to be paid well, because if you're not paid well as a teacher, you're going to find something else to do. And in a lot of countries, teachers will, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're young kids, they come out of university, they're all great, they want to get into teaching. They get into teaching, they find it's really hard work, the pay is very low, and after three years they, they realise, well, I could get a lot more money if I go and work in the mines or join a company or get into a business or something else and they leave and it means that in a lot of places the teachers are all very young people 
in Australia, I'm thinking of Australia particularly here. Um, and you rarely, you only get very committed people who are willing to stick it out and be a teacher for 40 years or something. Um, but that, that should be normal for my, that should be, a teach, being a teacher should be like a really respected p profession where that happens. And to do that, you need to be supported with good content, good um, professional development all the time, and so on. Now lastly, uh, I think in a quality education s sense, we should be thinking global. If you're at a school, you should be uh, connected with people in other places around the world. Other people in the, around the world should be part of your education so that you have this global perspective, so that you can speak more languages, you can talk to more people, you can understand how the world is, uh, is really in many ways the same and also different. And that's how we can solve big problems. All right, I've done enough lecturing, but does this, that explains, I hope, what the mission and the, the, the vision of Moodle is and why, what we're doing here and, and, and how important I think it is. To support that, we have values. The values of Moodle are the things that make sure we stay on the right path um, and that we have five. Um, so the first one is education. So this is an education situation. Every conversation you have with somebody is an education situation. Um, so recognising that's everywhere. Openness, obviously, we, we want to be open, we want to be transparent, we want to be um, uh, very open with um, the team, with the community, because that's how things that you didn't plan start to happen. Because everybody is working on the same things. Respect. Uh, it's very important to respect other cultures, other languages, to understand that people who are blind have just as much a right to education as anybody else, uh, everybody, everywhere. Um, and even competitors. I, I, I don't want to see Moodlers making, saying bad things about other products necessarily, just because they're different. If they have similar goals to us, great, good, right? Um, if they're trying to attack uh, education in some way or control it in some way, then yeah, not so good. So, but it's not about them, it's about the, the thing they're building. Uh, integrity, we should try and be, integ integrity means that doing the same thing every day as you do at work, at home, etc. And lastly, innovation, that we want to be a place where it allows innovation. And I know in this room there are a lot of people who innovate on the Moodle platform and innovate obviously in other places as well. And this can be innovation in a, using it as a teacher, but also it could be developing new software, new plugins, developing new businesses around it, etc. So, we are currently just about at 95,000 Moodle sites, and this number is climbing rapidly. Uh, we really have to have a big celebration when we hit 100,000 registered sites. If you haven't registered your Moodle site, Please do, because that's how the only way we know that who's using Moodle. Uh, these numbers are the minimum, because a lot of people don't register. Can anybody, is anybody brave enough to admit they never registered their Moodle site? Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> Come on. No, I'm not, not, not pointing you exactly. I just, uh, but say so, yes, uh, please register. Um, so uh, go ahead and do that like this afternoon. So India is here on one, two, three, four, five, six, number seven on the list. Um, isn't this like nearly the biggest country in the world now? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure, um, I'm sure that's going to go up quite fast. I it did some interesting little statistics looking at uh, the registrations and comparing it to the size of the population of the, the country. So the biggest Moodle-using country is Andorra, which is a tiny, tiny little country <laughs> on the Mediterranean. It's, I, I think they probably only have, a, uh, well, how many Moodles? They have 31 Moodle sites in Andorra. Um, but the population is so low that it makes them the first. But uh, probably one of the major countries that's a, a large country is Spain. 
And uh, we have one of our developers from Spain here, Sarah, at the front. So say hello to her when you see her. Uh, she's part of our team in Barcelona, and uh, uh, we, are, we are really growing our, uh, our team in that country. So that's a very big Moodle using country. Uh, there's a, you may have also seen some other news that um, we, f we found an investor. So, so Moodle has been growing for 15 years, basically in a straight line like this. So, and I've never been in debt. Moodle has never been in debt. Every time we get a bit more income, I get more developers and we get more people, right? Um, but as you're about to see, we have a real need to go a bit more like this and grow fast. And that's because this open project is competing against Microsoft, Google, Apple. There are many big players in the world now, and we need to be, uh, and we need to keep up with the technologies. So I've been looking for about two years for an investor, somebody who uh, a had money to give us, but b it had to be the right kind of money. It had to be somebody who believed in the mission and somebody who was not interested in the profits, because we are not about profit. We don't have profits really in Moodle. So uh, a few months ago, we finally uh, closed after a long time of discussion and so on. I met this family that comes from uh, France, and uh, they are the right kind of people for this project. These are people who, they, they've said to me, look, we're here for 20 years. <laughs> uh, we believe in you, we believe in the project. We want to we support everything you're talking about in your keynotes, right? So uh, we, we took $6 million earlier this year, and that's a good boost for us because that lets me hire a lot more people to do some things. So these are the things I want to talk about that we're working on. It's time to make Moodle a bit more amazing. Now, there's some problems first before I talk about what are the problems of Moodle. Well, Moodle's often seen as not easy to use or not pretty. Uh, and uh, I think you're probably, a lot of you might be familiar with those, yeah, those reactions. And there are lots of reasons for that. It can be made easy. It can be made pretty. But it's not easy or pretty to make it that way. <laughs> um, Teachers often don't drive it very well, and they're, because they come, they're, they're usually just thrown in, there you go, here's Moodle, go, there's an LMS. And most people teaching have never been a student online. They don't really understand what it's like to be a student. And so they do the simple things, they do quizzes, the obvious things, they put content, and they stop. <laughs> so. And that's usually because educators don't have enough support. And lastly, Moodle is not like a super good, uh, it's not super good at being in the places where we are all the time, in social media, uh, on these devices. Uh, it's a website, it's a PHP application, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit, for students it looks a bit, you know, old fashioned in a way. So these are, these are problems, we can fix these problems. So the solution is we have five big projects, and I'm going to go through them. The first one, uh, well, what I'm going to say, these five projects in two years will be Moodle. You will just, everyone will call the, that Moodle, because they all work together, these five projects. But there are five pieces, and they all help each other, and they all make the new system. So firstly, the Moodle learning management system. This is the thing that you're familiar with, the one you download and the one that you run. The PHP application. It's, uh, it, it is an old piece of software. It is 15 or more years old. But it doesn't matter because the way we run applications now is getting more flexible. So there's not really any need to rewrite Moodle. We can deliver Moodle differently. Now you have virtual machines and virtual machines and virtual machines and virtual machines. Uh, it doesn't matter um, the age of a software. Moodle has a very good 
fundamental design, I think, still. It has a structure that makes it very flexible and very expandable, and you can make it as small as you want or as large as you want. And that's all we need. Our main focus, number one, is on usability, making it usable. And it's the user experience. And when I say usability, I don't just mean how pretty it is, because you can make Moodle very pretty with themes. What I mean is the, the usability is about the workflows. So one workflow is uh, the assignment date has just finished. And as a teacher, I need to go and grade all the assignments. So first of all, I have to know where they are. I have to go in. I have to go through the assignments and grade them and release the results to students. So that's a, a workflow, right? That's something I'm going to sit down and do, take two hours, and that's my job to do. Now, in that little workflow, we can reduce the number of clicks. We can make it easier to get the information and so on. So that's a, one example. In Moodle, there are hundreds of workflows, little things, jobs you have to do. How do you find information? How do you do something in response, etc. The second one is integrations. We're working a lot on integrations, and particularly uh, we want to work on integrations with open systems because I want Moodle to leverage other open projects, and I want other open projects to influence Moodle. So we have to connect with other things that are out there. Uh, some of it is through standards, and some of it is through integration uh, plugins. The third part is about consistency across devices. Currently, the experience you have on the Moodle mobile app, and I don't know, how many people here know we have a Moodle mobile app? Most of you? OK. I didn't ask the other way around. I didn't want to embarrass you. But there, there is, a mo if you didn't know, we have a Moodle mobile app. Now, this is designed for these small screens, but the experience is slightly different to the one you get on the website. And it shouldn't be. It should be the same. It should feel like the same system. And when you are halfway through something on this, you should be able to put it down and finish on the other device. And lastly, there are many advances in the world of computer science with artificial intelligence, with statistics and analysis. We should be, Moodle should be an active participant in the learning process by which I mean it's a, you have computer-aided teaching, computer-aided learning. Note, I am not talking about Moodle becoming a teacher. We are not about disrupting and replacing education systems. We're about empowering. So if a teacher, if, a, if Moodle can talk to the teacher and say, hey, you need to focus on this, or this is happening uh, in an intelligent way that actually makes it like an assistant, then you can handle more people. You can teach 1,000 people or 10,000 people because you have the assistance of the system. So these are the main focuses going forward. As I was saying, Moodle itself doesn't need to change. The basic structure of plugins and integrations works well. But what is changing is the devices that we use to access it. So we have computers, we have mobiles, obviously, and tablets. But in the future, there's more and more virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, in about five years, a lot of us are going to have, I predict, uh, phones probably, some device that you carry around, and a screen, which is glasses that you put on. And a lot of what you s comes through here will appear on your glasses. And they may be very light, and they may be built into your normal glasses, but the digital world is now connected with the real world. And so, you know, I could create a giant Taj Mahal here on the, on the stage in 3D and we can all see it because we all have the glasses and we're all, they're all connected to the same experience. This stuff already exists. It's just not everywhere yet. It's not cheap and it hasn't got everywhere. In, we also have voice interfaces. You can see a lot of them around. A lot of the big players are building voice interfaces. And, and they work, when they work well, they're actually really fast. It's much easier to say, hey, Moodle, uh, how many students haven't uh, finished their assignment yet? 
and Moodle will go, oh, there's still three students who haven't. That's the same three who, didn't, who were late last time. Do you want me to send them a message? And you go, yes, send them a message. Um, and it will send them the message. That's a much faster interface than press, press, click, 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 right? But the, I don't see Moodle as being in, in this augmented reality space or Moodle doesn't need to do the voice stuff. The other technologies will do that. The devices will have that. Moodle just needs to interact with them and it needs to be the place where grades end up, where experiences are launched and then grades come back and things like that. Um, we can just leverage those other technologies. So that's, you know, it's very achievable. So we just released Moodle 3.4. Uh, it's got a lot of cool new features, uh, mostly about usability. We didn't add a lot of new features. We are focused on making Moodle work better, not, ma not making it do more. Because it already has so many features. Um, so one of them is uh, the calendar now operates more like web calendars you expect, drag and drop. Uh, you can change dates of, of assignments or uh, quizzes or any activities. You can just move them around. Uh, we fixed uh, the participants page with enrolments. It's a lot better now. It still needs more improvement, but it's a good solid step forward. It's now a lot easier to control the people in your course, uh, or at least whether they can get in or not. Uh, analytics, the new analytics engine we've built, which is the foundation of the AI stuff I was talking about. This is how Moodle will know things through this uh, there's a machine learning engine and it's connected to looking at the data in Moodle and from that it makes insights and uh, decisions about what it, what it sees and it learns and you're going to be teaching it eventually. You're going to be saying, no, you're wrong or yes, you're right, more of that, less of that and you're making it improve. So this is now in Moodle core from 3.4. And from, as I said, going forwards, the big things on 3.5, we're looking at user experience, and we've got some very good user, user, new user interfaces coming soon. Uh, we've got integrations, as I said, open stuff. Uh, in, in Europe, there is a, a big push towards the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulations. This is a good initiative. It forces software makers to think about the protection of data and privacy. And it has many things in it. For example, people under age should have appropriate protections when they put their data into a system. Uh, another one is that if you leave a system, you should be able to ask for a complete collection of your own data from that system. Right? Imagine, uh, I don't know, say you quit Facebook. Yeah, you might want to dump all of your photos and all the stuff you put into Facebook. Just have, I want, I want a copy of that. It's mine, right? I put it in there. I want it out. So it's forcing all systems to have that functionality. And so Moodle has to do these things too. Now, the other part of uh, Moodle is the Moodle mobile app. And if you haven't seen it lately, it's, uh, it's really evolving and becoming very capable. Uh, so it looks nice. It works well. And... Uh, this is what the next generation might look like. We, this is some of the UX work, that, uh, user experience work that our team are doing. And you can see it's getting much more attractive. It's working really well. Uh, it has, I can't quite see it so clearly, but you get an idea. Um, it's, it's really improving. And it, we've now hit the point where the features in the mobile app are 100% of the Moodle features for students. So students can spend 100% of their time just in the app, and they don't need to go to the website at all, which is really cool. It's actually what, not only what most students probably want anywhere in the world, but in, in lots of places, this is your only computer, so like you rely on that to work. And the app, of course, has the big feature of working offline. So you connect to your courses when you have internet. You can download all the courses including SCORM, including quizzes, including forums, assignments, everything. And you can work offline. You can reply on a forum. You can post an assignment. You can do a quiz. You can do a SCORM. 
And then when it reconnects to the internet, it synchronizes back and pushes everything back to the server again. Now, we have a feature. You can actually have it, the app branded to, to your university or, or company. So if you want it to look not like Moodle Mobile, because the app is free. You can go to the app stores and get Moodle Mobile, right? And you get the orange app. But if you don't want it to be orange, if you want it to be your colours and have your name, uh, we have a, a system for doing that. So you can come and talk to us, moodle.com, and we can make it so that you have your own app. It's updated every two months. It's always, always updated. Um, it's, uh, the login is easier. You don't have to put the site. You just put username and password and you're in. So if you're interested, come and, come and talk to us. We also have a version of the app which works on desktops. So Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, full screen, same functionality as the app, but it works on a desktop, on a, on a laptop. The last thing I want to say about uh, Moodle, Moodle, the product itself, is that if you're interested in the future of the Moodle fe the features, uh, you can have a say on the core features of Moodle uh, through the Moodle Users Association. So your institution can join. Uh, there's a whole lot of different membership levels from very, very cheap, about the price of one meal in this hotel, uh, to uh, a lot more. And you take part in the association on deciding what Moodle should do next. And the project, for example, the calendar work, making the calendar more modern, that was a Moodle Users Association project. And uh, the association takes the membership money and pays developers to make those features. Uh, we also have a foundation coming. It isn't the last thing. Oh, wrong, I forgot there's one more. Um, we're starting a foundation in 2018. In, it's being based in Europe. But if any of you are involved in research around online learning, uh, with research projects or you have PhD students or uh, grant funding or any kind of projects like that, the foundation is going to be in the middle of that world, organising projects, being part of um, developments, uh, more integrated with other open initiatives, etc. Um, and that's going to be a really exciting thing because a lot of this stuff happens anyway without Moodle being involved. Moodle is used for about half of the education projects in Europe. Uh, and they, people just download it and use it, right? And they never talk to us. So, All right, I better move on because I think I'm running out of time, probably. When do I have to finish by, Tom? 15 minutes. Woo. All right, awesome. So I said there were five things, right? And I'm going on a long time and I'm just ranting here. I want you to talk more to me for the next two days, but right now I need to, I've got a lot of information I want to get out. So I said there was five things, and the first one was just Moodle Core itself, the Moodle product. The second one is Moodle Cloud, and I know Moodle Cloud is very popular in India. We have, uh, who, who here has a Moodle Cloud site, actually? Can I have some hands? Okay, we've got about 20, 30 people here. So Moodle Cloud is a, a, our hosting system. Uh, we have about 25,000 Moodle sites on it, and uh, all kinds. And the, it will continue. Our purpose is to make a, a cheap, effective Moodle for everybody. Uh, a lot of those sites are free, uh, uh, but some of them are, are, are cost a little bit more. And, and we're going to be developing that over time to make it more, more cost effective, have more solutions there. Uh, and be a, a really good place to try Moodle, a really good place to uh, also, even if you want to try the latest version of Moodle, just demo it. You can go and get a site on Moodle Cloud and try it because it always has the latest version. And maybe you're, if you're at a university, actually, how many people here at universities? I should get an idea of what, who, who's at a university or involved with a university? Okay, I'm guessing about 15, 20%. Okay, how many people here are in schools? So uh, everything to K to 12. Okay, you're all on one table. Hello. Okay, and a couple of you over there. How many people are involved in companies or have a company that does work around Moodle, actually? Uh, just some work around Moodle. Okay, about 
it's 30%. How many people are in a company that use this Moodle like for training, just internally, like you use it as a product, Moodle? Okay, look at that. What are the rest of you? <laughs> Anybody got something else you want? Yeah. I'm sorry? Academy for Languages. Okay, great. Excellent. Anybody else in like a special academy or a other education institution? Oh, yeah. Okay. From the business school? Okay, great. All right. Better idea. Thank you. Um, all right. That was number two. It was Moodle, Moodle Clouds. Number three out of the five is Learn Moodle. Now, I talked at the before how a lot of the problem that we see is that people don't really use Moodle very much. <laughs> they might have Moodle, but they're not really using it to its maximum. And they're not creating quality experiences. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There's no blame. But I think if we had the availability of um, training and courses that people could have to learn how to teach online, this would help us a lot. And so. We have a curriculum that we've been building uh, to learn to teach online uh, with Moodle. Now, the leader of that team is Tom Murdoch, who you already met this morning, so he's there. Uh, Solange, sitting next to him, is also in this project and is keynoting tomorrow. Uh, and there's sessions this afternoon as well, so I'm not going to talk too much more about it because they're going to cover it. But I'm just saying we have this project. It's very exciting to us. And we really want to make it a global, um, multilingual thing that has uh, even certification infrastructure, so you can get certificates. And we'd also like it to be included in university curriculum somehow, to have accreditation so that having your Moodle certificate is credit towards a bigger education certification. Um, I'm not even going to go through this because you guys are going to talk about it. Um, the next thing, number four, is Moodle services. So our job at Moodle is to, we are between the people who need help, who are using Moodle and may need help, such as teachers and administrators, and there are many people who provide services, who, who have expertise, who can uh, do, assist people, and that may be training, it may be consulting or development or making themes or making content, or all these things. And our job is to connect Moodle users with people who have services. So the, the main plan we have right now is the Moodle partners. And we have all three Indian Moodle partners here at the conference. And um, I'm really pleased to have them here. Iabias, we've got Ballistic, uh, and Vidya Mantra. Um, and we also have integration partners for particular, pro particular products. So technologies that work well with Moodle, we have partnerships with them as well to make sure that they're, and, and we're going to be growing that with a lot more integration partners. Um, so we have a plan in Moodle for our team who handles all this to grow and to be much more effective at driving this services uh, and, and making sure people have help when they need it. Yeah. So um, I won't go into the details of that, but that's a big focus for us to improve that whole system. Now, number five, and this is the new one. This is, this is really new. This hasn't existed really properly before. Um, and it's called MoodleNet. I can't show you any screenshots yet because it doesn't exist yet. But we have a team that are already working on it, and we have a lot of great ideas. And I just want to explain it to you, and I think you'll understand what I'm getting at. So I talked before how teachers need professional development. It's not only how to use Moodle, but they need to learn how to teach in general, they need content, they need support, they need friends. Often a teacher in an institution who teaches one subject is alone. They're the only person teaching that subject in that institution. So they may have many other professional associations they can be part of to find friends, but wouldn't it be great if Moodle hooked you up with other teachers that were teaching the same subject, at the same level, in the same language, uh, and it was very easy to find them. So something like, imagine LinkedIn, but for education. Imagine if that was integrated with your Moodle site. So you're looking at your Moodle course, and it's empty, 
and you're just starting and you're new. And on the side was, need help? Go to MoodleNet. And you log in and you start finding people who can help you. Um, and not only people to talk to, but you also can find content to get you started. Whole courses, or maybe just pieces. So we want to connect all the open education resources into this so you can find them easily, you can search them all quickly. We want to make systems that let people build Moodle courses and share them. Now we had an older system, we still have it, called Moodle.net, which I started, it must have been eight years ago, it's a long time ago, and we never really got it going, we never really supported it, but the idea was about enabling course sharing. This is a bit different because what we discovered was if you just make a place on the internet and say, hey, everybody, share your stuff, it doesn't work because uh, there's no reason for people to give away what they worked on very hard. You need to give them a motivation. And often you're prevented. You can't put your school courses out on the internet. You're not allowed to, right? The institution says that belongs to us. You can't do that. So what we want to do is build a way for people to get paid to build stuff, right? So imagine a teacher says, look, I'm, I'm actually really good at teaching, um, you know, uh, let's say French uh, to native Hindi speakers. And that's kind of a, a niche thing, but there might be a lot of people who need it, I don't know. And that's uh, someone who is very good at that is in a position to build a course for the other people who can do it. But they're not going to do it for free. In fact, they shouldn't do it for free. Because um, people's time is valuable. We shouldn't be asking everybody to do things for free. We should be finding a way to get people paid for their work. So one way we can do that is a little bit like Kickstarter, like a crowdfunding thing. So that teacher can say, OK, I will, I will make a course for teaching French to Hindi native speakers. Um, but it's going to take me a lot of weekends, I have to be away from my family, I have to make sacrifices, you know. And they, they come up with some price. And they say, if, if we can gather some money for this, and MoodleNet will facilitate it, then I can deliver it. And if everyone who wants that course likes it, then the money is released from them to the, to the, to the creator, the content goes in there, and now MoodleNet has a piece of Creative Commons licensed content. So the next person who comes along, and they have to teach French in the Hindi context, they got an empty course, and they go, I need some help. Oh, they find a whole course waiting for them, right? So they can just download a course, and now they can play with it and tweak it and make it their own. But they get a good start. So that's kind of the basics. That's some of the basic stuff. There's a lot of other stuff in here. But basically, MoodleNet will be connecting Moodle users between sites. And it's really important to us that MoodleNet is something that we can all trust. It can't be a Facebook. It can't be a LinkedIn. It can't be that sort of system. It needs to be something more like email or like HTTP. It needs to be something built for the long term. And designing a system like that is much harder to do. But we're, that's what we're trying to do. And we need everybody's help. It's got to be open. It's got to be safe. It's got to be private. It's got to be ethical. It's got to be connected and transparent. Um, that's the only way this thing is really going to work beyond a couple of years. It's got to be something very big. So we, are, we have a lot of ideas about that. All right, I'm nearly there at the end. I did say already that uh, Moodle HQ is moving uh, a lot of our focus is into Europe, and we're building up the team in Barcelona uh, to be part of Europe. Europe has a lot of Moodle users. Um, I don't see any reason why we can't have more people in India also. Um, but uh, yeah, we are becoming, we're working more, even more globally than we were before. So we, we're going to be very busy. I'm going to very, very quickly go through some ways that you can be part of Moodle as a contributor. So how can you join in? First of all, you may want to get a branded Moodle mobile app. Um, uh, it's not only for the feature that you have. It's good for your students to have your institution in the app stores. 
but you are contributing towards the project and helping to fund everything we're doing. Secondly, you may want to join the Moodle Users Association. If you haven't looked at it, have a look at it. You have a voice to actually help decide new features. You can use Moodle for research. If you are doing any online research at all, uh, Moodle is a, the best platform to do it on because you have so much data and so much of a global perspective that you can uh, get, do the best research. If you need a quick small site, just use Moodle Cloud. That's why we put it there. If you need any consulting or hosting or any other services, talk to our partners, Vidya Mantra, Iabius or Ballistic Learning. Uh, they are experts in Moodle. They've all been using Moodle for many, many years and uh, it definitely can help. If anything I've told you is you're starting to have ideas and you're thinking, hey, that could be something, just come and talk to me or Tom or any of us. If you've got any grant funding going on and it involves Moodle anyway, just drop us a line because who knows, you might be able to use that work. It could affect Moodle core. And instead of just helping one school or one state or whatever it is, you could help the whole world a bit, right? Yeah, maybe you want to join our team. We're hiring. We're hiring a lot of people. Uh, so uh, I, I expect it to be crushed a bit after this one. But um, anyway, I, I come and talk to us. Um, and last thing I want to say is I think supporting open practices is one way to support the UN sustainability goals. Um, and I hope you agree because... Uh, this is what we're all trying to produce here, these sorts of people. So thank you very much. Um, I'll...